Now, First Peter, we're going to be really, I'm going to do it the same way I did last week. I want to talk to you this morning on the topic of defense mechanisms, defense mechanisms. Turn in your Bible to First Peter chapter 1, and here's what we're going to do. Instead, go to First Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start there, and then we'll work through 1 and get to 2. I'm going to, we're going to start with the end in mind. Let me catch you up. If you weren't here last week, I tried to make the case last week that First Peter chapter 1 is all about hope and holiness. Because of your great hope, Peter is telling his people, and remember the people are scattered out throughout the Roman Empire, full-blown persecution under Nero hasn't started yet, but things are starting to heat up. Christians are starting to feel not so at home in their home country anymore. Any of this sound familiar? Christians are starting to feel like maybe their, maybe their viewpoint is not as welcome as it once was. And so he calls them resident aliens. He says, you're aliens and strangers. But because of your great hope, you need to live a holy life. And he ends in, in verses like uh, 16, uh, 15 and 16 in chapter 1 with a quote from the Old Testament where God says, Be holy, for I am holy. In other words, the holiness of a Christian is grounded in the holiness of God. All Christian ethics are grounded in the character of who God is. So it's all about holiness. And because of your great hope, be holy. Now, it all depends on what you associate with the word holy, whether or not that gets you excited. See, if, um, if you hear holy, for most people, it's like, hey, the sermon today, the preacher's going to be encourage you to live a holy life. Uh, that doesn't get many of us too excited because of what we associate with the word holy. You know, the first, what's the first thing that comes to mind? You, anybody think of uh, uh, holy rollers? Or the holy rollers? What about a holier than thou attitude? You ever met somebody that's holier than thou? They're a lot of fun to go to dinner with, you know. In fact, you know who the most self-righteous people on the planet are? It's the people who just started a brand new diet two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, you go out to dinner with them and they're looking at you like, I don't know how you can put that garbage in your body. You're like, the same way you did two weeks ago, man. We're getting righteous on me, you know. Uh, Colin Smith, who's a pastor just outside Chicago, he uh, found a list, they did sort of an informal survey, this uh, news report, on what words or ideas people associate with the word holy. And here's the list that people came up with. When they heard the word holy, thinness, hollow-eyed gauntness, beards, <laughs> sandals, long robes, stone cells, no sex, no jokes, hair shirts, <laughs> frequent cold baths, fasting, hours of prayer, wild rocky deserts, getting up at 4 a.m., clean fingernails. I don't... <laughs> like somebody actually listed that as their answer when they associate holy, uh, whatever. Stained glass, self-flagellation. If any of that is coming to your mind, then no wonder it's not attractive when you hear, be holy. No wonder it will come, I hope, as a great relief to you to know that the Bible definition of holiness has nothing whatsoever to do with any of these things. So you can get these images of ancient monks, you know, uh, 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 whipping themselves for their sins in their stone, you know, cell and taking frequent baths, and you can get all that out of your head. Holy means cut, to sever, separate. Uh, I can give you a gruesome illustration, and I've learned over the years, gruesome means you'll remember it. Uh, but if I'm making dinner, <laughs> which would be gruesome, I know, yeah. that's not the gruesome part, that's not the gruesome part, but if I'm chopping carrots or something and I accidentally slip and chop off my thumb, I could hold up my thumb and say, this thumb is holy. That's what the Bible definition means. Holy. It is separated. It is no longer intermingled with the body. It is completely severed, cut off, set apart. That's what holiness means. When the Bible says God is holy, it means he's not enmeshed with creation. He's wholly other. He is separate. He's not part of the creation. He is the creator. Set apart, separated. So when a Christian is born again and goes from being a child of the devil, the world, the flesh, and the devil is what we were after. When we're born again into a living hope, we are suddenly cut off, severed, separated from evil and wickedness and malice and slander and deceit and hypocrisy and envy. 
And that begins to get attractive. Everybody in here, I don't even have to ask. I don't have to ask. Every single person in here has had someone they know and love affected by this dreadful thing called cancer. Everybody in here. We all know somebody. And I long for the day, and I pray for the day when that is eradicated and gone forever. But we've, we've all been affected by somebody. Now, when they're doing surgery on somebody to get cancer, I don't want to hear, we talk about holiness, I don't want to hear the surgeon come out and meet with the family and say, well, when it comes to the tumor, we think we got most of it. I don't want to hear most of it. What do I want to hear? I want to hear we got all of it. That's the idea of holiness, completely set apart. I don't want to be intermingled any longer with the cancer of wickedness. I don't want to be any longer uh, connected to the poison of envy. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be any part of that dreadful prison that was sin. I want to be holy. God is holy. I want to be set apart completely. Now, last week, I tried to make the case that Peter is saying holiness is a byproduct of hope. So I want to tackle the next passage by looking at the same thing in reverse. If holiness is a byproduct of hope, then unholy living is a byproduct of fear. Think about it. Unholy living is a byproduct of fear. Peter's audience had every reason to be scared. We have every reason to be scared. And when we get scared, all kinds of bad and unholy things happen. We sin, I believe, many times as a defense mechanism against fear. Now, stay with me. Uh, why would we um, pick, pick an example? Our sins are because we're scared, and the sin looks like it can get us out of trouble. It is a defense mechanism. So why, uh, okay, why would I steal? Why would I steal? Why would I take something illegally or, or cut corners or maybe steal from work or steal from the IRS or, or pad that expense report or, you know, and I'm, I'm going to pay it back. I just need to cover it, whatever, right? This is the thinking. I'm just embezzling a little. I don't call it embezzling. I call it, you know, shifting things around. Yeah, right? Why would anybody ever do that? Here's why. Because <clears throat> I'm scared there's not going to be enough. And I'm scared I'm going to lose out. And, I'm scared, and this, is a, this, is a one, this is a one-time thing. It only happened once. I promise it won't happen again. But, but I, I'm scared I'll lose out. And I'm scared I'll lose out. So my defense mechanism is stealing. Now, God, I know you say you'll provide for me and you're a good shepherd, but I don't know if I can trust you. I'm scared. And so in a moment of fear and panic, steal. Take something illegally. See? Why would somebody lie? Well, I'm afraid you won't like me if you know the truth. So I'm going to lie. I'm going to present... With, we don't call it lie. We call it image management. Right? I'm going to present to you an image of me that I know is not true, but I do that out of fear. Even little kids learn this. They're in trouble and they're panicked. Did you do this? Nope. Why do they do that? They're scared, and that lie, is, they've learned, is a defense mechanism. Unholy living is a byproduct of fear. We use these unholy defense mechanisms. I'm afraid you won't think, if, if, if I'm afraid that you won't think I'm good, that I won't fit in, I'll wear the mask. Hypocrisy. See, that's hypocrisy. It's a defense mechanism. I'll wear this mask so that you'll, uh, I won't disappoint you. What, what about, what if I look around at others and I'm afraid that my life isn't as good as theirs? How come they have that? How come they get that? Why do their kids do this? If everybody else is doing it, what's my defense mechanism? Envy. It's envy. I begin to envy the lives of others. Why? Because I'm scared. My life is just passing me by and I don't have all these things. I don't have access to all this stuff. If I'm afraid that others are getting noticed, I will. And I, sometimes I don't even know I'm doing it right, but it's a defense mechanism. But I'm scared my coworkers are climbing the corporate ladder faster than me. Every chance I get, I'll bring them down just a peg. I won't bring them down 30 pegs, but I'll bring them down a peg. I'll let him know. Well, no, I mean, I, I know, I know he, he, he did that. But, you know, really, you know, <clears throat> anybody could have done that. Or, I, you know, I, listen, I, here's what's really going on. Slander. Why? It's a defense mechanism. I'm scared other people are getting ahead. And so by bringing them down, I think maybe I can lift myself up. We use these things as defense mechanisms. And these are the very defense mechanisms Peter says you no longer need. 
You've been using these things as defense mechanisms for way too long. It'll take time. It'll take trust because you've learned this is how you can defend yourself when you feel afraid. But I'm telling you, now that you've been born again, you don't need these things anymore. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. So put away. This means take off like, a, like, a, like an old set of clothes. Remember when Jesus brings Lazarus out of the grave? He's still wearing the grave clothes. His first command Take off those grave clothes and let him go free. Why? Because he's been brought back to life. He doesn't need that. He's saying, take off, take off these old clothes, these old defense mechanisms. Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Let's look at these things one at a time. Let's look at that first one, malice. Malice is another word for just general wickedness, evil. This is, uh, this is when people have a hard heart. This is like, uh, you're the kind of person that would say, I like to get my revenge in first. This is, you think, well, I would never be guilty of that. Whoa, whoa. Malice is, uh, we're guilty of malice, I think, when we uh, engage in what we call cancel culture. You know about cancel culture, right? Somebody says one thing you don't like, they're dead to you. Why? Because they hurt you. And so I'm never going to be hurt again. I'll put on a, well, you know what it's like. I'll put on malice. Malice is like a heavy winter coat. Put this heavy coat of malice on, see? And now, people try to hurt me. They're going to hurt me again. Fool, what did it say? Fool me once, shame on you. But fool me twice, shame on me. You're not going to hurt me again. I'm going to harden my heart. And I'm just going to cancel culture. Come on, we've done this. You hurt me, that's it. You're dead to me and never again. Can't hurt me again. I'm taking my ball and going home. I'm, I'm, I'm going to harden myself against other relationships, and I'm going to wear this malice like an old winter coat. You see it in, uh, i tell you where you see malice uh, driving. Don't you? How do you explain road rage? It's malice. Why are people have road rage? You say, oh, because they're angry, because they're wicked. No, it's because they got scared. So you cut them off. And you threaten them, and you threaten their precious children in the back, and now they're furious, and now they're following you in a minivan. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Why? Because they're scared, and they, you threaten them. You see it on the Little League ball field. That ref made a call, and that hurt my kid. And they're screaming. Why? It's malice. Put on malice. Not going to hurt me again. Mm -mm. I'm going to wear malice like a thick winter coat. Deceit and hypocrisy are related. Deceit is when we're scared that people won't like the truth, and so we wear deceit like a heavy winter scarf. If you choose to live an authentic life, people will reject you. And so deceit carries the idea of baiting a trap. It looks like a delicious piece of cheese to the mouse, but it's meant to kill. People say, I would never do that, but have you lied? Lying is deceit. Lying is hiding behind uh, 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 the, these lies because you're scared and you want to get out. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Oh, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is like an old winter hat. <laughs> hypocrisy is when you care deeply about what people think of you. <laughs> I obviously don't. But the idea is you're wearing the mask of another. Image management, right? I, if, if, listen, if I'm, you, sometimes you will be two different people based on the group of friends you're with. That's hypocrisy. You're one way when you're with your church people, and you're another way when you're with your work people, and you're another way when you're with your family people. You're wearing the mask of another. It is a defense mechanism because more than anything, we're worried, what if we won't fit into this group? And so we live in hypocrisy. Envy and slander are closely related. Envy and slander are like a thick winter pair of gloves. Envy. Envy is resenting the good that God is pouring out in another person and utterly ignoring the good that God is pouring out on you. Now, I've made this point before, but envy never crosses a line, does it? You're only envious because a lot of people say, I'm not envious. Whoa, that's because you're thinking of other people. You're only envious of the people who are like you. Envy never crosses a line. A piano player can hear about a great painter all day long and join right in the praise. But the minute a piano player hears compliments about another piano player, suddenly envy stirs up. Moms only envy other moms. 
Pastors do not en- envy bankers. We don't envy car dealers. We, we do not envy worship leaders at all. <laughs> you know who pastors envy? Other pastors. See, envy never crosses lines. And envy is fear that I'm missing out. And why is God blessing this person? And Peter, when he says envy, Peter knew something about envy. Do you remember at the end of John chapter 21 when Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, follow me. It's going to lead to your death, but follow me. Instead of saying, sir, yes, sir, Peter looks at John. At the end of John 21, he goes, Lord, what about John? And Jesus looks at him and tells him two things. Peter, mind your business and follow me. His exact words are, if I want John to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. But what he's saying is, mind your business and follow me. Can I tell you right now, revival would break out in Coleman, Alabama, if we would mind our business and follow Jesus. We have a problem in this city with slander and gossip. Slander's the next one. It's envy, slander, gossip. And listen, social media does not create envy and slander. Social media just accelerates it. Social media is like the rails upon which envy and slander can now move more quickly. So slander is like envy. It's this other glove. How can we slander others? By misreporting them or when we're unmerciful to them. We, we take what somebody says about somebody without any context and we suddenly think we know the full story. A Christian, uh, I, heard, I heard this week a great quote and it's sadly true. A Christian defines keeping a secret as only telling one good friend at a time. See, if you tell everybody at once, that wouldn't keep the secret. But if you tell a good friend one at a time, you're keeping a secret. Listen to this old Puritan on the topic of slander. He says, a slanderer is worse than a thief. Sure, one is publicly odious. In other words, we all hate the thief, yeah. But the other robs us of our greater treasure. Why? Proverbs 22.1 says, a, rep, a good name, your reputation, is Rather to be chosen than great riches. In other words, your reputation is worth more than money. And he's saying a thief can steal the money, but a slanderer steals your reputation. And a wrong done to the estate is sooner repaired than a wrong done to the name of others. What does he mean by that? If I smash into your car and I have to fix that, or I uh, took something that belonged to you, I can repay, I can make you whole with money. But if I slander you, it's going to take a long time to repair your reputation. See? When the wound is cured, the scar remains. And it's a very great evil to do wrong to their names. Now, y'all. I don't want to wear these clothes anymore. It is somehow statistically impossible, but I'm told the humidity day was 101%. And I'm wearing them in June. And of course, I don't want to wear these, but don't you see, I have to. They're my defense mechanism. Now, if you saw me walking down Highway 31 and you said, Tom, this is ridiculous. You don't need these winter clothes. It's June 6th. I'd say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I need them. This is ridiculous. Your preacher is up here in all these winter clothes in June 6th. Some of you are starting to get hot and sweaty for me. Like, on my behalf, you love me so much, you're empathizing right now. And I'm telling you, I, yes, but I need them. This is what I've always learned. You need to keep yourself safe. And you would say, don't you know how ridiculous you look? When you see a Christian with malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, the angels are looking at you like you're looking at me right now going, don't you know how ridiculous this is? You don't need those things anymore. You needed them when you were lost, you thought. But now, you don't need them. You can take them off. What's my point? Unholy living is not just sin. It's unnecessary. For a child of God, unholy living is not just sin. Of course it's sin. But if I say to you guys, quit being unholy, it's sin, you might not understand. Peter's point is, it's utterly unnecessary. You don't need these things anymore. You don't need them. So Peter says, so take off. Hey, Do you know who you are? Do you know what's happened in your life? Take off malice. I'm gonna take off envy and slander first. There's a sort of the ordo salutis. (laughs) Take off envy and slander. Take off malice. Oh, it's so freeing. Take off hypocrisy and deceit. Why? You don't need that stuff anymore. You needed that stuff. Why don't you need that stuff? 
That's the stuff you thought you needed before you got saved. Those are unholy defense mechanisms. And you don't need that for three reasons. And I want you to write these down. These are going to be the points and we'll be done. The three reasons you don't need these unholy defense mechanisms. So take this stuff off. Why? Why therefore take this off? Why? Number one. Write this down. Number one. The first reason is unholy defenses are unnecessary because of who your father is. The angels in heaven are looking down at Christians wearing malice like a coat of armor and, and, and deceit and slander and hypocrisy and envy. They're going, don't these kids know who their father is? Now we're going to go back to chapter 1 verse 17 and I'll walk you through this and we'll go point by point through that. So chapter 1 verse 17, look. Unholy defenses are unnecessary because of who your father is. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. All through this chapter, there's been so many parent-child references. Uh, Verse 2, father. Verse 3, father. Verse 4, inheritance. Verse 5, guarded. Verse 14, obedient children. Verse 17, father. Verse 22, brotherly love. Verse 23, seed. And it culminates in chapter 2, verse 2, newborn infants. There's all this father-child imagery. He's saying, for example, for example, take deceit and hypocrisy. Hey, uh, why is deceit no longer necessary for the child of God? Because your father is the impartial judge of the universe. There's no fool in God. There's no fool in God. God sees everything. You might fool an earthly judge, and no earthly judge is perfect. Earthly judges are, of course, supposed to be impartial, but no earthly judge is perfect, and there may be some partiality, and thus justice is not properly served, but there will be perfect justice with your heavenly father because he is an impartial judge. So you can quit lying. You can drop the mask. He sees everything. There's no need to wear deceit or hypocrisy. You don't need it because he's an impartial judge. You say, yeah, but but that's the whole point. That's the reason I wear the mask. That's the reason I want to put on my best front, even if it's sometimes a lie, sometimes a little bit deceitful. I tell others that I'm a little, because I'm scared. Well, that's the other part. You have a father who's a judge, but you also have a judge who is your father. He's your heavenly father. He knows everything about you. He sees everything, listen to me, and he loves you anyway. He was the judge who was judged in your place. Reverend Terry Anderson, who's the pastor of Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church down in Houston, has a great illustration about not needing these holy defenses because of who our father is. He said, he's an older gentleman, and so uh, he uh, uh, makes a reference to uh, growing up. Uh, he grew up in Louisiana, and he says that uh, his mama was going to make his favorite biscuits. But she needed a product, and some of you uh, won't know what this is. Others of you will know what this is. She was missing a particular ingredient. She needed Clabber Girl baking powder. Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, you heard of this. All right, you'll see it like maybe in Cracker Barrel or some old, old-timey. Uh, maybe they still sell it. I don't know. But anyway, needed this particular kind of baking soda or baking powder or whatever it is. And uh, uh, it was, uh, the sun had set, but the stores were still open. And um, uh, he, uh, she sent him to go. He was just a little boy. And he said, I didn't want to go Uh, because between him and that store was the neighbor with the terrifying dog. And as a little boy, he would walk by and he was just certain that dog was going to eat him for lunch. He was scared to death. And he said, I did not want to go. But I sure wanted biscuits. (laughs) And so he's working up the courage when suddenly his father says, you know what? I'm going to walk with you tonight, son. He said, now this changes everything. He said, you have to understand, I'm from a generation where uh, uh, kids were scared of their parents. (laughs) I know what he means. He said, my dad loved me. He showed me his love. But there was a healthy fear. There was a reverent fear, you know. And, uh, but he said, he's walking. And uh, he said he knew where that dog's house was. He knew knew where that dog was coming. And he was on his way to get that ingredient for the biscuits. He said, and every now and then I would reach back for dad's pant leg. (laughs) Make sure dad's back there. He said, and then when I got close to that dog, I reached back and I grabbed dad's pant leg and that dog just went crazy and I yelled, bark all you want! Because I got my daddy. Christian, you're going to go through some dark times. You're going to face the condemnation and the accusation of the enemy and you're going to face everything the world, the flesh, and the devil has to throw at you. But when you go through the darkness or you're scared by the barking of the dogs, it makes a big difference when you're absolutely clear who your daddy is. 
when you are clear who your heavenly father is. You reach back. You know he is there. You don't need deceit. You don't need hypocrisy. We sang a hymn at 8 a.m. Oh, worship the king, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his power and his love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion and splendor, and girded with praise. That's your heavenly father? What, is the, what are these defenses? What, come on, what is hypocrisy and deceit going to do for you? Be defended by my father who is the judge and the judge who is my father. Unholy defenses, secondly, they're unnecessary because of who your father is, but secondly, Unholy defenses are unnecessary because of how you've been redeemed. How you've been redeemed. Look at verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Listen, you can't. (laughs) Peter's audience would have understood this. A Roman slave could be purchased with silver or gold or Bitcoin. Probably not. Probably silver or gold. And redeemed and ransomed. And a slave could, in fact, earn enough to, make, to, to buy their own freedom and then be set free. Fine. But how are you going to ransom a slave to sin? If you are morally bankrupt, what is the redemption for that? What will buy God off when you face him at the end of your life? No perishable things like silver or gold. So how do you ransom a slave to sin? There's only one way. And there's only one word appropriate for this price, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Probably should circle that word precious, if not in your Bible, in your heart. It's precious. A.W. Tozer tells an illustration of uh, uh, two men that were out Camping and hunting and years and years and years ago before GPS before you know all the fancy equipment and they were up in Canada somewhere and a snow drift caught them unaware caught in a blizzard and they realized pretty quickly they were in dire straits they couldn't figure out uh, their way out they were too far couldn't get a hold of anybody there was one hope and only one hope and if that is they could make a little shelter ride out the storm they would eventually be rescued if they could create warmth fire they uh, were just hours away from death if not. Uh, exposure and frostbite, and then they would, they would just sort of sit down, and once they sat down, they would just sort of, that would be it. And so um, they, they get all the kindling ready, and they get, and uh, they, got to, they find they have three matches. And they strike the first match, and the cold north wind blows it out, down to two. They strike the second match, and it, they think it's going to take, and suddenly it's also snuffed out. And the the third match, this is it, strikes it, and the wind blows it out. And then they look at each other as the howling winds continue, and it gets dark. And that's it. It's over. And they realize. Frantically, they search through everything they have. And there, in the liner of one man's coat, it had fallen down into the lining. He felt something. And sure enough, take out a pocket knife, cut the lining, pulled it out. It was half a match stick with the match head still on it. And he looked at his buddy and he said, do you know what the most precious thing in the world is right now? That match. Not a million dollars, not silver or gold. In fact, if you had a million dollars, you would trade it for that match in that moment. If it catches, we live. And if it fails, we die. So they get all the kindling. They do everything they can possibly do to get it ready. They strike that match. And it just barely catches a little corner of the paper, which catches a kindling, which catches... And soon they have a fire. They're rescued three days later because they kept that fire going because of that match. It was precious to them. It, it was worth more than all the silver and gold in the world. Do you know if, uh, if Jesus Christ, if his sacrifice on the cross is acceptable to God, then he becomes the propitiation for sin that turns aside wrath. If Jesus Christ's death on the cross is sufficient for our salvation, then heaven is open before us, an invitation to God the Father for all eternity, new heaven, new earth. And if he fails, if Jesus Christ for some reason is not acceptable to God the Father, or if he in any way was sinful or imperfect, if he was not spotless, then we're all bound for hell, eternally separated from God the Father. He is precious. His blood is precious. 
So how, how am I, now let me ask them, how are you going to envy somebody? What, what are you doing with envy? What are you doing with the defense mechanism of envy? You have Christ. You have his blood. You have the most precious thing in the world. How are you going to envy somebody else? Verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. I think a lot of translations say for you. The ESV is highlighting here for the sake of you. You should circle precious and you should underline for you. He didn't just die. He died for you. So how are you going to slander somebody? What could you possibly slander somebody for doing that you have not done? What could you possibly slander? Christ had to die for you. Our sin is responsible for Jesus Christ's death on the cross. How am I going to big time somebody else? How am I going to slander somebody else? Oh, can you believe they did that? Look in a mirror. <laughs> uh, when I uh, do a, a, a marriage counseling and then when I, a pre-marriage counseling, and then when I do weddings, I often quote, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis quote who says uh, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. There's no need for slander. Verse 21 who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Take off envy, slander. You don't need them anymore. Last one. Unholy defenses are unnecessary because of who our father is and unholy defenses are unnecessary because of how we've been redeemed. And finally, unholy defenses are unnecessary because of your new eternal family. I love this. Look at the last verses of that chapter. Verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since, here's why, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. In other words, every man-made religion, every false gospel, every philosophy, it's going to fade away like grass, like the flower of grass. The, the grass withers and the flower fades. But you were born of the gospel, the word of God. You were born again. And that means you're going to be connected with sincere brotherly love. You're going to be connected to this new eternal family. And you are asked to do something. Go back to verse 22. You are asked to do something that I know upon first glance you think is impossible. You are being asked to do something. You're, you're being asked to do this. You guys have heard, you know, love one another. You've heard it say love one another. Yeah. And uh, you've always been taught, you know, oh, yeah, I love one another. And, I, you know, I really got to try to love this person. Here's what Peter says you're being asked to do. Love one another and actually mean it. Love one another, but not like strain and work hard to do it. Love one another and actually have a love that comes from a pure heart. You say, now, nah, I don't know if I can do that. Well, you say, well, that's impossible. Now, hold up, hold up. That's, um, let's be clear. There's a difference. That's really, really hard, but impossible? When you became a Christian, isn't it true? If you are a Christian, does the Holy Spirit live inside of you? Let me ask it in such a way that you can give a verbal answer. Hey, church, as a Christian, does the Holy Spirit live inside of you? Yes. Be absolutely clear on this point. The answer is yes. You're correct. If, the Holy, if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. So if you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, don't talk to me about impossible. Something can be really, really hard. But if the Holy Spirit inside of you is calling you to love people, he can change your heart in such a way you can love people and actually mean it. Not just love people, but love them earnestly from a pure heart. That is incredible. And you're thinking of people right now that are in the family of faith and you're going, ooh, I don't know. I, I work so hard. I will try to love them. I, I work so hard. Apparently, if you will allow, the Holy Spirit can change your heart in such a way you can love them in a pure heart. And I know you're thinking, oh, but I'm thinking of people and they're so hard. But here's the thing. There may be some people right now who are thinking of you. But in a way, that's good. If we have a community of faith that is asking the Lord for the grace to love one another sincerely with a pure heart, it means we don't need malice anymore. Why? We've got this family for all eternity. 
And listen, if you've got somebody that you're a brother or sister in Christ and you haven't reconciled with them, you need to reconcile with them now because you're going to be with them for like all eternity. Let's go ahead and get sorted out now. Uh, you may know uh, the story of Sheldon Van Auken. Uh, Sheldon Van Auken in 1930s uh, married Jean Davey, and um, uh, he had a, a tragedy in his life. Um, uh, his wife, Jean Davey, um, died, and, um, uh, but before uh, she died, he became friends. In, he was a student at Oxford. He, that's, that's, that's how they met. So he and his wife are friends in Oxford, and um, he tells this story in A Severe Mercy, and it's his autobiography, and it's his connection with a guy who also lived in Oxford. I didn't know Sheldon Van Auken, but Sheldon was a good friend of, a good friend of mine, C.S. Lewis, who uh, he tells this story that, um, and, and of course there's the connection because Lewis also lost his wife, tragically. But in, this, in the book of Severe Mercy, um, they find themselves at the end of their time there at Oxford, and they had developed a deep, deep friendship with Lewis along with another, a whole rich community of intellectuals and artists and sciences, theologians. Uh, Lewis actually helped Sheldon come to faith. So Sheldon finishes school, and he and his wife are going to go back to the U.S. for a teaching job. Before he leaves, they have lunch at their usual spot one last time. And there, uh, the great professor and writer, C.S. Lewis, uh, makes an interesting statement. He says that, you know, I know you're leaving for America. I hope you'll come back to England, Lewis says, because we mustn't get out of touch. At all events, he said with a cheerful grin, we'll certainly meet again here or there. And of course, he's not talking about America. He's talking about there, the other side, glory. Then it was time to go. We, you know, shook hands and... Lewis again said, I shall not say goodbye. We will meet again. Second time he said that. Then he plunged into the traffic, and I stood watching him. When he reached the pavement on the other side, he turned around. I guess he knew I'd still be standing there. And he raised his voice in a great roar. You know, Lewis had this great, loud voice, bellowing voice. A great roar that easily overcame the noise of the cars and buses. Heads turned, and at least one car swerved. Besides, he bellowed with a great grin, Christians never say goodbye. That's true, isn't it? Christians never say goodbye. Because of the relationships we have, they're born of imperishable seed we have in Jesus Christ are for all eternity. So you can put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and all envy and all slander. You, listen to me, don't need those defenses anymore. You're safe. You don't need malice. You don't need to attack somebody. You don't need slander. You don't need envy. God is your father. You don't need malice. He sees everything. You don't need to see. He redeemed you. You don't need to be hypocritical. Listen, I'm your brother. There's no need for envy. <laughs> if, I, if, if, if a Christian, look, if, if you want something that I have, I'm your Christian brother in Christ. You don't need to envy. I'm going to share, right? That's the, 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 the great blessing of, of, of Christian family. If God blesses me, I'm just going to bless you. If God blesses you, you're just going to bless me. This is, this is why there's no need for envy in the family of faith. And he's ransomed me with his precious blood. There's no need for slander. He is all the defense we need. So put away unholy defense mechanisms. Let's pray. Oh God, would you grant to us the grace to believe, the faith to believe that we don't need these unholy defense mechanisms because we have you as our Father. And because we have been redeemed, not with silver or gold, but the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And because you've set us in, etern in, in eternal family. So God, grant that we might crave the pure spiritual milk of the Word and that we might gaze deeply into this good news, this gospel good news, that we would no longer put on these defense mechanisms. And just as a man looks ridiculous dressed in winter clothes on June 6th, so Christians, we must look ridiculous to wear malice or envy or deceit or slander. We don't need them. And Lord, if there's anybody here who's not yet a believer, let today be the day that they receive you. They're born again and let them feel the freedom that comes from being separated, set apart from these vices. God, grant believers this continual putting off of these things that we put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
We ask this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.